Committee will come to order. The Subcommittee on TARP Financial Services and Bailouts of Public and Private Programs. Uh, our hearing is entitled, Credit Crunch, Is the CFPB Restricting Consumer Access to Credit? Uh, we have two panels today. Uh, first, uh, Director Richard Cordray of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And then in the second panel, we have uh, four individuals uh, that are both uh, from uh, think tanks and from uh, the private sector. Um, the uh, tradition of this subcommittee is to begin with the Oversight and Government Reform Committee's mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in, in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission statement of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will now uh, recognize myself for uh, the purposes of an opening statement for four minutes. Today's hearing is the, uh, on this subcommittee. Uh, we'll examine how regulatory actions of the CFPB can restrict access to credit, as well as the metrics and tools uh, the Bureau employs to consider the availability of credit in the course of its supervisory rulemaking and enforcement work. The American people deserve consumer protection regulations that discourage and discipline financial fraud without compromising access to credit for consumers and small businesses. As our country continues to exhibit sluggish job growth and the possibility of slipping back into a recession, it has become more important than ever to ensure that our markets encompass uh, adequate liquidity and credit for American businesses and families. Mr. Cordray's unprecedented appointment earlier this year has already resulted in a lawsuit that, if successful, could invalidate uh, all of the CFPB's actions uh, since his appointment. Such legal wrangling, as well as the regulatory actions of the CFPB itself, creates uncertainty that may restrict credit as financial institutions brace for full implementation of Dodd-Frank. Uh, Mr. Cordray has uh, been a, uh, a great public servant over his career. Uh, we may disagree on policy, but uh, he has a, a strong reputation. Um, the, uh, the appointment and uh, the process of appointment does raise a lot of concerns uh, outside of, uh, of that. Uh, Mr. Cordray's own testimony uh, before this subcommittee has not helped to alleviate much of the concern about uncertainty as he and the Bureau have been uh, vague and continue to be vague uh, in many regards uh, about the definition of, quote, abusive practices uh, by market participants. And since the subcommittee last met with more, uh, Mr. Cordray in January, the CFPB has proposed or finalized rulemaking that will increase the regulatory burden for financial institutions and consumers without conducting what I believe is necessary, which is a thorough and robust cost-benefit analysis. The Bureau's consideration of the qualified uh, mortgage rule has been met with dismay from lenders and experts who believe the rule could make consumer borrowing more expensive. That is a great concern. Many experts also believe that the QM rule could make it harder for consumers to compare mortgage options and reduce consumer choice. That is a major concern as well. I would urge Mr. Cordray and the CFPB to consider these consequences as the housing market is finally beginning to see some daylight. In addition, the finalized rule to regulate international remittance transfers sent from consumers in the United States has already resulted in a reduction of services for consumers. State, Bank, uh, State National Bank of Texas has stopped offering the service and, est uh, and estimates that uh, roughly 3,000 to 4,000 other community banks will exit the remittance transfer uh, business uh, because of the rule. 
In light of these negative consequences to certain CFPB regulatory actions, the Bureau should join other independent regulators that have taken steps to improve their cost-benefit analysis. Both the CFTC and the SEC have, of uh, recent, um, undertaken efforts to implement uh, vigorous cost-benefit analysis of the likely economic consequences of new regulations. With our fragile economic situation, now is the, not the time uh, for overly aggressive short-sighted rulemaking by the CFPB. Today's oversight hearing represents this subcommittee's commitment to ensuring that government regulators strike the appropriate balance between protecting consumers and ensuring that there is sufficient access to credit. That is the purpose of today's hearing. And I thank Mr. Cordray for returning before this subcommittee and uh, for his willingness to submit to oversight from Congress. I certainly do appreciate that. And with that, I will now recognize Mr. Quigley of Illinois, the ranking member, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing and thank uh, all of our witnesses for participating this morning. Uh, Congress created the CFPB in the wake of the financial crisis when it became painfully obvious to everyone that credit markets were not working for American consumers. Unscrupulous lenders were able to take advantage of consumers by selling them faulty, fraudulent, and deceptive financial products. This reckless lending poisoned the financial system and directly contributed to the credit crunch and the mortgage meltdown. We explicitly created the CFPB to protect Americans against these fraudulent and abusive products. And we know too well that the accumulation of faulty products in our financial system is as much a risk to the system as a whole as it is to the borrower and the lender. I <clears> would <throat> like to read from the CFPB's mission statement. To make markets for consumers' financial products and services work for Americans, whether they are applying for a mortgage, choosing among credit cards, or using any number of other consumer financial products. Markets work best and access to credit is enhanced when regulators reduce the risk of fraud and deception. Director Cordray, I would like to welcome you back to the subcommittee and thank you for testifying today. This is the fourth oversight committee hearing by my count to focus on the CFPB. Director, in January you testified before the subcommittee that upon your swearing in as director, the CFPB gained, quote, its full authorities to investigate and bring enforcement actions. Earlier this month, the CFPB announced its first public enforcement action, which focused on credit card marketing. Specifically, on July 18, 2012, the CFPB found that the vendors of Capital One Bank engaged in deceptive marketing tactics to pressure or mislead consumers into paying for add-on products. Capital One was ordered to refund approximately $140 million and pay an additional $25 million in penalties. The type of action is important, as you stated in January, to ensure that financial providers are held accountable if they violate the law and that the rules of the road governing banks and non-banks are applied even-handedly. This is exactly why we created CFPB, and so I am glad to see it actively protecting consumers through enforcement actions. I am also glad to see CFPB taking action on student loan debt. In March, the Federal Reserve of New York reported that the total outstanding student loan balance is $870 billion. That is greater than the total credit card debt and auto loan debt combined. The Federal Reserve also reported that Americans over the age of 60 currently owe $36 billion in student loans, highlighting the, the unique longevity of student loan debt. The sheer amount of outstanding student loan debt demands attention, especially as we look to finance our children's education. In July, the CFPB rolled out a tool to help students who have fallen behind on their payments and understand their options so that they understand their options for going forward. This is a welcome step forward in an area of the economy that has previously received too little attention. I look forward to fur further CFPB engagement on the student loan debt issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the ranking member, and members will have seven uh, days to submit opening statements for the record. We will now recognize our first panel. The Honorable Richard Cordray is the Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It is um, the uh, policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn before they testify. I know you are uh, testified uh, regularly before Congress, and I appreciate that. But if you will please rise and raise your right hand. 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, let the record reflect that the, an he, that the witness answered in the uh, affirmative. Um, we'll now begin uh, uh, with uh, five minutes of testimony before uh, this subcommittee, then we'll go to a round of questions, as you well know. You know you're very aware of the lighting system that we have. Uh, you have five minutes to summarize your opening statement. Uh, Green means go, yellow means uh, hurry up, and red means stop. So uh, with that, we'd certainly like to give you every opportunity to, uh, to testify. Uh, Mr. Cordray. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me back today to talk about the importance of the availability of credit. At the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we know that access to credit means access to opportunities. Mortgages allow people to buy a home and spread the payments over years. Student loans give people access to further education. And credit cards give people immediate and convenient access to money when they need it. These products can help people achieve their dreams. Unfortunately, the financial crisis of 2007-2008 caused investors to flee lending markets. Most of these markets have recently shown some signs of improvement. Credit card originations are growing at a modest pace, and we're seeing a more significant growth in auto and student lending. But it concerns us, as it surely concerns you, that many consumers today are shut out of certain credit markets, especially the residential mortgage market. Lending standards are quite tight, and it appears that many creditworthy borrowers are having trouble buying homes. This is making it tough on consumers, and it's making it tough on the broader economy. At the Consumer Bureau, we're working to help change this for the better. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act directs us to use our authority to achieve two broad purposes. First, we are to ensure that the markets for consumer financial products and services are fair, transparent, and competitive. Second, we are to ensure that all consumers have access to these markets. Because credit can create opportunity, we think these two goals work in tandem. This means we work with the industries we regulate to come up with the best, most common sense solutions to problems. We want to increase opportunities for consumers, not diminish them. This means we're coordinating our rules to reduce unnecessary burdens and we're holding small business review panels to help us gather input from small providers in particular, such as community banks and credit unions. Indeed, the Dodd-Frank Act specifies that in our rulemakings, we must explicitly consider the potential effects of our rules on access to credit. We do that by consulting with industry and with consumer groups, and we work hard to consider all the evidence when analyzing the issues. Before we propose a rule, a team of attorneys, economists, and market experts evaluates alternatives in terms of their potential consequences for consumers, providers, and the market. This team conducts quantitative and qualitative research wherever possible. They obtain and analyze data and review relevant studies. They consult extensively with industry experts, consumer advocates, and stakeholders from small and large firms, banks and non-banks. Industry veterans on our staff help us understand how the market really works and how a rule might affect consumers and providers, both substantively and operationally. For example, our work on the ability to pay mortgage rule illustrates how seriously we take our obligation to consider effects on credit availability. Later this year, we will finalize rules to implement this new statutory requirement that before making a mortgage, lenders make a good faith and reasonable determination that borrowers have the ability to repay the loan. Lenders will have to verify and document that point. In implementing this statute, we want to fulfill its purpose of ensuring that consumers are not sold mortgages they cannot afford. And we want equally to ensure that consumers who can afford to repay loans can find those loans are available to them in the market. We will seek to define these lower risk loans known as qualified mortgages carefully so that as the market stabilizes, every segment of the market is competitive and investors will have an incentive to participate in the lending market. We will strive to craft a sensible rule that works for the market throughout the credit cycle while being attentive to just how fragile and risk averse the market seems to be today. We recently reopened the comment period to be as transparent as we can about the data we are using in this rulemaking and to see if lenders or others have any more pertinent data to share with us. Through these additional efforts, we hope to muster the best available evidence to help us decide how to implement the statute in a manner that will both prevent unaffordable loans and preserve access to credit. 
In sum, Mr. Chairman, we are keenly aware that the market is waiting to see the precise shape that our rules take. That is why we are working to put in place our regulations by the deadlines that Congress set. And that is why we are being as transparent as we can in doing so. We want to help provide the mortgage market with the clarity needed to improve performance. At the Consumer Bureau, our goal is to make consumer financial products and services work better for Americans, for the honest businesses that serve them, and for the broader economy as a whole. An effective marketplace means access to credit, which is essential to providing the opportunity that consumers need all across this country. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Cordray, thank you so much uh, for your testimony and uh, thank you for your uh, service, uh, your public service um, and your long career in, in public service. I uh, now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Mr. Cordray, I know that you uh, you've, uh, I'm aware of this, but the National Bureau of Economic Research outlined that half the American people, roughly half of the American people, uh, couldn't come up with $2,000 within 30 days to meet some unexpected challenge. I, I think th that is uh, proof positive both of the, the depth of this uh, economic downturn, this, uh, these tough economic times we are facing, but also uh, the limitation in the credit markets. We have 25 percent of the American people that are either unbanked or um, underbanked. And, and as such, uh, we see some limitations. Um, with credit products um, available to the American people. And so in your estimation, you know, how do you resolve this and what obligation does the CFPB have to ensure access to credit products and a greater access to credit products? So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. And it's something that we have been uh, focused on in a number of our uh, community uh, field hearings and other uh, events that where we get outside of Washington, uh, we have been considering the payday lending industry, uh, the overdraft uh, issue, uh, and prepaid cards, which are various means by which the short-term need for credit is being met uh, in our economy. Uh, I would agree with you that there has been, not only has it been documented by research, but we hear it from people all over the country as we go out and talk to people face to face, and we hear it from them uh, as they submit stories to us that they need short term access to credit. Uh, one of the really great insights that uh, is embodied in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is that we both are overseeing uh, large banks. Uh, the very largest banks, and also non-banks, so that we don't have a bank-centric view of this. Uh, if people are pushed outside the banking system and they have to survive on financial products such as uh, payday loans and other, other types of things, uh, we care a great deal about that because we have to oversee those providers as well. Uh, and so for the unbanked and also the underbanked, the many people who have a bank account but still use many alternative financial services to meet their needs, uh, it is very important to us to understand exactly what those needs are, how they can be met better, how they can be met by products that don't further deepen uh, the hole that, uh, that many Americans find themselves in uh, as they try to meet their needs day to day. And it is something that, as I said, is a focus of quite a bit of our efforts. So I appreciate your attention to it uh, as well. So the answer is yes. CFPB does have an obligation to ensure that there is access to credit products for the average American. I think that's part of our mission, absolutely, yes. yes. Okay. And, and we discussed this before, and I have asked you this before, but inherent in regulation is both a cost and a benefit. And it depends your point of view of said regulation on whether or not uh, you think the uh, you know, we should focus more on the cost or the, more on the benefits. But certainly, uh, whether or not you uh, view a regulation as proper and good or uh, improper and destructive, um, you, you need to weigh both the costs and the benefits. Uh, as you go through ongoing rulemaking, um, the costs and the benefits, will they be accounted for? And is that a major concern that you have? Uh, so, so the answer uh, briefly is yes, it is a major concern for us, and for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, first of all, at, at, a, at a minimum, at a baseline, it is legally required that every time we adopt a rule, uh, we have to consider under our statute the burdens, the impacts, 
uh, and the benefits uh, of the rule. And we have to size those up. And frankly, if the uh, burdens are not outweighed by the benefits, it's not the kind of rule we should be going forward with. Uh, second, I, I think that's just common sense. Uh, and as you say, if you're doing more harm than good, then you shouldn't be doing uh, what you're doing. Uh, but it requires a careful uh, assessment. Sometimes these can involve lengthy analysis. Uh, some of our rules are longer than I would like because, in part, we are engaging in careful cost-benefit analysis. Uh, moreover, the courts require and are increasingly requiring uh, the ability to review very careful analysis on this subject. And so for all those reasons, I think it makes sense for us to do that. I think it's essential for us to do that. And if we uh, don't do it, uh, it puts our rules in jeopardy. Do you believe there's a linkage between overregulation and a lack of credit availability? I think that uh, if you look at the history of this times, the thing that has most constricted credit to consumers and has most hamstrung lenders has been the credit freeze, the credit crunch, the financial collapse, and the ensuing recession that started in 2007, 2008. Uh, that has been what has dried up credit across this economy. Now, Sensible regulations, we think, had they been in place, might have uh, averted that problem. I mean, you can say the same thing going back to the 20s and the 30s. Uh, what caused credit to be tight in the 30s? It was a financial collapse and an ensuing depression. Did the SEC dry up credit because it got created in 1933? I just don't think anybody would think that Well, uh, I mean, to, to that point, I, I certainly understand that not exactly answering my question. Friedman and Schwartz and Bernanke determined the finite and, and uh, eventual causes of the Great Depression. It was both Fed policy and bank failures. I understand that. And uh, we understand the storm that we've just gone through. Yep. The concern I have is getting an insight into your worldview on regulation. Um, and certainly I understand your view that uh, enhanced regulation is, is, uh, is better uh, than uh, less regulation. Uh, but what I'm asking is, is there a point by which overregulation does restrict access to credit? So w what I would say is better regulation is always better than worse regulation. But of course, that's somewhat in the eye of the uh, beholder. Uh, I think that regulating an entire market rather than part of a market, which is part of what was done before the crisis and before the uh, uh, financial reform law was passed, is not a good uh, recipe for success. Uh, but I would agree with what I think is the tenor of your question, which is, can the pendulum swing too far in the wake of a crisis like this? Can, can people overreact and can they potentially uh, compound the problem? I think that is always a possibility. And so it's important for us to be thoughtful and careful about what we're doing, not just assume that because it's meeting a problem that existed before that uh, everything that uh, everybody could think to do is necessary and helpful. Uh, and I think that, again, I find that coming here and having these sessions where you all have input into what we're doing uh, is helpful for, for shaping our perspective. Uh, but I do think you can't look at what happened uh, in 2007, 2008 without realizing that we need common sense reforms. Uh, and yet I would also agree that if the pendulum swings too far, you could compound the problem. I, I would agree with that. Thank you. And, um, and I certainly uh, appreciate the fact that uh, rather than touting the line I've heard over and over again is that the, uh, the huge fallout uh, of the financial crisis was due to a lack of regulation. It was bad regulation that, that was a driving force of that. And I certainly appreciate uh, uh, your willingness to be precise uh, when, when you're discussing that. So with that, I'll recognize the uh, ranking member, Mr. Quigley of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let's, let's talk about that a little more. Um, there was a lack of regulation to a certain extent, wasn't there, Mr. Cordray, on certain aspects that got us into this mess? I mean, we could always do regulations better, but uh, there were aspects of that just weren't there that helped create this crisis. I, I actually intended to say it was both uh, uh, lack of regulation and bad regulation in different respects. Let me take an example. If you look at the mortgage market uh, before the financial reform law was passed, uh, only part of the market was regulated. Inevitably, that leads to uh, uh, irrationalities. 
because you have certain players in the market who are held to certain standards and others who are not. Uh, that uh, uh, encouraged a race to the bottom where the irresponsible lenders were crowding out the responsible lenders like community banks and credit unions. Uh, that was both, you know, I guess it, you can define these things various ways. That was due to lack of regulation in significant parts of the market, and overall that reflected bad regulation because an incomplete regulatory system is not going to work because it's going to encourage some to do things that other people cannot, uh, the very things you're trying to constrain among the regulated entities. So uh, I think there was a combination of things. And, Director, you just mentioned community banks. Illinois probably has as many as any state in the union. I, I think they're, they're feeling this pinch as much as anyone and that fine line that your agency is trying to walk. Um, but y you, I think you'd acknowledge that there isn't a, a necessarily a level playing field. A lot of things that have happened and the rules that are in place for them. Uh, our concern is you know, how you handle that regulation. Uh, how you handle the, the, the concept tiered regulation notion. Um, you know, this is a different business model. The, the complexity matters more to them. How do you balance that with community banks? So this is an issue that comes up over and over again for us. Uh, when we go around the country, we always make it a point to have a round table with uh, community banks and hear from them. Uh, and those are interesting. I, I find them very helpful sessions. They're pretty candid with us. They talk about some of their anxieties and fears. Uh, some of those, those fears are, are misplaced. We do not enforce the law or examine uh, any institutions with less than $10 billion in assets. But then we talk also candidly about their concern about the regulatory regime and how complicated that can be for them. They have fewer employees to spread that burden over. Uh, and it's something that I have heard again and again and I feel sensitive to. So as I have said and, and as we've demonstrated, you know, the first rulemaking we undertook was the remittance rule that we finalized that we inherited from the Federal Reserve. Uh, we immediately issued a supplemental proposal to consider setting a threshold below which institutions would be exempt from complying with that rule if they don't do remittance transactions in the ordinary course of business. And we are going to set a threshold on that, and it will exempt some number of institutions from the rule. Uh, and I think that that is, I know in my case, uh, the reason we're doing that in part is because we've heard and we are persuaded by the notion that smaller community banks have a model of serving their customers in the community where most of them live and reside. Uh, that they are very high touch with their customers and they don't necessarily have to be held to all the same uh, requirements and standards that larger institutions that are more remote from the community uh, would be. Uh, and that's something that we will bring to our thinking about all of our rules. Uh, it's a case-by-case -case matter, obviously. It depends on facts and circumstances of what kind of issue we're talking about uh, and how that plays out for them. It's also something we hear quite a bit about uh, in the small business review panels that we've been doing on our rules. You know, that's a special requirement that the Bureau has imposed upon it by Congress. Uh, no other banking agency is subject to that additional process. Uh, we have found that uh, it has been useful to us. We're getting insight from that process. It is helping us write better rules. And so although it is more burdensome for us than for others, we're also finding that it's advantageous and, and we're, we've begun to see uh, the wisdom of, of Congress uh, imposing that requirement. Yeah, and as you said, you're committed to those panels, and there are several that would apply directly to the community bank's issues, and you're, yeah. you're committed to fulfill those requirements. Yeah, and I also have committed to creating a special advisory board uh, of community banks and a separate one for credit unions. We're in the process of doing that. We're getting close to announcing uh, that. Uh, which I think will help give us insight because we don't have the day-to-day -day contact with them. We don't examine them, as I said. Uh, we don't have any law enforcement authority uh, against them. So it's important for us to find other ways to make sure we have that strong line of communication, and we're trying to do that. Thank you, Mr. Director. I yield back. We'll now recognize the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Genta of New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cordray, for uh, being here this morning. I just want to follow up on something you just said, and correct me if I'm wrong. You said you don't have any legal authority, I think you said against, you used the word against, uh, community banks and credit unions. That to me sounds like you're on one side and community banks and small banks and, and credit unions are on the other side. 
um, as if there is a, 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 a relationship that is more negative and, and as opposed to one that is more positive. It, was that your intent in, in that remark? So that, that is not my view. Uh, I think what I said very specifically was we do not have any enforcement authority against community banks. I think it is kind of hard to characterize enforcement authority as anything other than if you are enforcing the law against someone, you know, you are potentially uh, finding them in violation of the law. We don't have that authority. We don't have the authority to examine uh, community banks uh, either. Uh, we do have the authority to write uh, rules that could affect the community banks, and that is where we are trying to make sure we take plenty of input and are sensitive to the, the difference in their business model, which I, I tend to agree is a different traditional uh, positive working, working business model that did not in any way uh, lead to the financial crisis in this country. And therefore, as I talk, spoke earlier about making sure the pendulum doesn't swing too far, uh, I think that that is something we should be very mindful of, and we are trying to be mindful of it. And when I come up here, I find that you all remind us of it, helpfully. Thank you. Well, I come from a small state, New Hampshire, 1.3 yes. million people. And we very much are small communities throughout the state. Uh, rely very much on yep. the positive relationship between the individual, the small business owner, the job creator with that community bank and with that credit union. And uh, the reason I ask this is as I have met with uh, that group of people, those, those small business owners, and when I say small, I'm talking about somebody who might employ under 100 people. I know the definition can go up as high as 500, but I'm talking about really the, the, the individual who's got maybe 50 employees or less, 100 employees or less, who are telling me now that they don't have access to credit, uh, but they're not saying it for the reasons you're saying it. What they're expressing to me is a concern of an over, uh, an over regulatory burden. So my, I want to try to figure out how do we, how does the CFPB deal with what I'm sure you're hearing in field hearings, uh, or at least that's what I hear. Maybe, maybe you don't. But when, if you hear in a field hearing that a small business owner can't get access to credit because the community bank or the credit union is saying, look, we're small. We have stifling regulatory responsibilities, stifling regulatory burdens that are uh, really stopping us from taking that, that reasonable risk to lend money to a small business owner so they can expand. How do you deal with the creation of this new entity, the CFPB, uh, the responsibility of new regulation, but also take into account that part of these regulatory burdens could, in fact, have a negative impact on job growth, on, on economic uh, growth, and on, on job creation? Uh, so we try to take account of that by getting a lot of input from uh, from the entities involved. But I, I want to go back and and. But you said you haven't you, you haven't put together. You said you were going to put together a group of community banks and and credit yeah, unions. I've, I've committed it's it's not required by law, but I th thought it would be very helpful to us to have an you advisory do that, group. Of will you do that before any new regulation is put in place by the CFPB? Uh, we're going to be doing that within the next month or so, so uh, we're doing it uh, right away. But, but let me would stress. Would it be before, though? Let me, let me get an answer. Would it be before any new rule or regulation is, is authored by the CFPB? I think between now and then, the only uh, rule that we'll be finalizing is the exemption threshold on remittance transfers, which is actually a burden-reducing measure for small institutions. But let me go back. Small businesses were constrained in being able to get loans uh, in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008. That's when the credit dried up. That's when the credit freeze occurred. All through the rest of 2008, all through 2009, all through 2010, the small businesses were dried up from access to credit. The CFPB, Dodd-Frank wasn't even passed at that time. The CFPB was not even created at that time. That's when they started to feel the severe credit crunch. Now it continues as the fallout from that continues. But the CFPB has only finalized one rule at this point, and it relates to international money remittance transfers. So the notion that we have created this immense burden on smaller institutions is, is absolutely well, factually it's the, incorrect. It's, it's the uncertainty that, that people have 
and there is great concern with new rules on top of existing rules that I continue to hear from business owners and from community banks and credit unions. And I mean, I, I, I go and visit every time I'm back in New Hampshire, and I consistently hear this. So it is an issue that I have been asked to bring back and, and ask you about and, and suggest to you. Uh, if you're going to create that advisory group of credit unions and community banks, that they have real, real input, not not just um, you know a letter of consideration, but real input on how the new rules and regulations are going to impact their ability to lend, and that's really the the point that I wanted to make sure that, that you were hearing at least from the people that I represent in New Hampshire. Yeah, but I see my time has expired. I yield back. Okay, the. Uh Ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Cordray, it's good to see you again. A majority witness on the other panel, uh, Mark Calabria from the Cato Institute, makes a, uh, a very curious assertion in his written testimony. And he writes, and I quote, <clears throat> as an educated guess, I would say that the CFPB has uh, likely increased the cost of consumer credit by at least two full percentage points. Have you issued any regulations that could have caused the tremendous impact the Cato uh, witness is asserting? And do you anticipate doing that? Uh, as I said, the only rule that we have, well, we've finalized two rules at this point. One was the AMPTA rule, which merely kept in place the status quo while we assessed uh, 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 that issue, uh, kind of a non-event. Uh, and the second was the remittance transfer rule, which was finalized in February, does not actually take effect until next February. No other rules have been finalized. So when you describe this as an educated guess, I guess I would put the emphasis on guess. But uh, uh, I don't think there's anything tangible uh, uh, that, that, that that rests on at this point in time. I mean, do you see that coming, uh, adding two percentage points? I mean, from anything you can see. I, I, we actually think that uh, m uh, much of what we are uh, contemplating, and frankly, most of it is required by Congress, mm -hmm. not discretionary. By us. Or, yes, okay. on, on the mortgage rules, should improve the functioning of the mortgage market. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's something that uh, we all know the mortgage market performed abysmally uh, in the run-up to the financial crisis and helped create the financial crisis. So improvements in the mortgage market should be good for consumers, should be good for lenders. Uh, credit dried up in the mortgage market because of the crash of the economy and because of the crash of the financial system. That's what dried up the credit. And again, that happened in 2008. It endured through 2009. It endured through 2010, all before Dodd-Frank was enacted, all before the Consumer Bureau was even created. Uh, and now we're continuing to be in the residue of that. So that's that's the real timing uh, here. Well, I, I don't know where Mr. Calabria pulled his number from. I'm sure he'll let us know. Sure. Yeah. And now let's turn to an informed industry uh, viewpoint. Last week, the House Financial Services Committee held a hearing on the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. One of the witnesses, Ms. Del Rio, who is the board chairman of a credit union in New York, testified regarding Dodd-Frank's and the C. FPB's impact on credit availability, and this is what she said. The Dodd-Frank Act and other financial reforms have not impeded our credit union's ability to provide low-cost loans and services to our members. In fact, our credit union's lending has increased in recent years. Director, have you heard similar accounts from other financial service providers, and do you think this is an isolated assessment? I think that uh, the data vary by institution. Different institutions are in different places. But I think what, what actually happened uh, in the financial crisis in the wake of that is there was an awful lot of non-bank, non-credit union shadow uh, lending, shadow industry lending going on, financing of uh, uh, non-bank lending. A lot of it was securitized. A lot of it was you make this loan and then you sell it to someone else. Uh, money was coming essentially from Wall Street. Most of that has dried up. 
that is a vast amount of funding uh, in the sector. So there are a lot of people who think that uh, community banks, credit unions haven't been lending. They are still lending. Uh, they are pretty much adhering to the same traditional business model that they had before. They found it harder sometimes to get financing themselves. They found that they are subject to capital reserves that can be constraining. Uh, but they are still plugging away with the same traditional business model that has worked for decades uh, in this country. Uh, what has happened is that this, some of the irresponsible money that was in the market has dried up, uh, and therefore lending as a whole is down. Uh, and that has been hard on a lot of people, but it is it's a fairly natural adjustment coming out of the kind of uh, financial crisis that we uh, had in 2007, 2008. Now, Ms. Jarrell said something else. She said there are times where we have to update a disclosure to comply with new regulations. We welcome these regulations. We want to be a transparent institution. This is our mission uh, so for us. It's not a cost. Um, I, I know everybody wouldn't say that, um, but she did. And she's a credit union. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, the transparency, how do you see that affecting uh, lending? Well, we know with everything that's updated and even simplified, there's still there's transitional costs that occur. But then going forward, uh, with every transaction, the transaction should be more likely to be successful. Uh, it should be in the aggregate. We're helping to stave off the kind of threats to the financial system that we saw crash the system in 2007, 2008. It's better for consumers. It makes the market work better. Uh, that feels like it's an appropriate uh, and positive uh, way forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We will now recognize Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cadre, for your uh, return again. I appreciate your collaboration with us and looking on this on this issue. I, I want to follow some of the some of the issues that have been identified by some of my colleagues because I too have been spending a significant amount of time with back in my community talking with with largely small business owners uh, and small institutions, banks, and credit unions, things which you have identified, if I'm correct in your testimony, as not really being outside or inside the scope of the problem, that, that a lot of the outliers, uh, you know, the non-bank kind of lending, participate in the creation of a lot of the problems. What I am concerned about is the regulation that now attempts to deal with the issue reaching back and really affecting some of these institutions. Um, let us take as a point, I think, which would be consistent through most of these institutions. Many in my area, about 100 employees, most of them probably maybe one compliance officer. I talked to one bank president. He is the compliance officer. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, you talk about the timing of the activities that are coming out. So this small bank, already they are dealing with the basal requirements. There was documentation that went out to these small bankers, 250 pages of documentation, which identifies what they must do within their small institutions with regard to retention of capital. Then in the same month of June, we had the qualifications that came out for what is um, a qualified mortgage. This was something small banks have been doing for years. The paperwork that identified what a small has been put in the Federal Register, uh, it is uh, about 115 pages that, again, all of the fine print, what concerns me is that is 150 pages with that kind of fine print. It looks to me like a litigator's dream to begin to try to codify all the things that bankers have been doing for years. But the real concern that I had in talking with my small community bankers was, we took the 10 pages that were part of the Truth in Lending Act and the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, and I understand the implications of trying to make it simpler for the buyer. But in the act of creating what it means to take 10 pages now, and we've reduced it to 8 pages so that the borrower can understand what's before him. But for the banker, this, this right here, 1,099 pages of regulations, 1,099 pages that one single compliance officer is going to have to go through to understand what it means to be able to interpret a document which has been in existence, you know, the Real Estate Procedures Act for 
for years and interpreted many times by the law. It's not the document. It has been the abuse of the document. How are we going to take into impact, trying to draw a distinction so that these small community bankers aren't pulled into the overregulation and a problem and an effect in which I'm concerned we're going to drive the ability of these small banks to continue to service the community. I'll ask them a question when I just give you one other observation. One of the bankers that I talked with was discussing the fact that when you have 100 people, you're very tight with regard to what you can task each to do. There was enough cash on hand to consider one or two new employees in the coming year. Do they hire lending agents that can go out in the community and negotiate loans? or do they hire compliance people? In both cases, it was compliance people. We are spending money on oversight, particularly in institutions. Now, so institutions that may not need the same degree of oversight as those who were the abusers in the process. Can you tell me how we're going to approach the ability to try to be fair and effective in the engagement with the small community banks so as not to dry up the very objective of creating credit in the first place? So, so I appreciate uh, the question, Congressman. I appreciate the chance to address what I think has been much misunderstood about the, uh, the rule that um, merges the Truth and Lending Act and Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act forms, which is something, by the way, Congress has been complaining about for 20 years. They wanted those forms integrated. They wanted them simplified. It's actually much more than 10 pages to 8 when you see the other things we're dealing with that go into that. Uh, but it's something that is now being accomplished by the Bureau for the first time in 20 years after 20 years of failure. Uh, but the notion that there's a 1,099-page rule is uh, not a correct statement of fact. Uh, much of what's in that rule involves detailing the, the efforts the Bureau has made uh, to reach out to smaller institutions, so brief a panel and so forth. Much of it is detailing the cost-benefit analysis uh, much of it is providing what industry tells us they want, which is some detailed guidance. It's not the rule itself, but it's additional guidance on how you can comply with the rule. So it feels to me that you can't one and the same time complain that the Bureau doesn't engage in sufficient extensive cost-benefit analysis and then complain when we devote a lot of pages in our proposal to the cost-benefit analysis that you've told us that you want. It doesn't feel right to complain that the Bureau doesn't do enough outreach to small institutions and then complain when we do the outreach reach, and it actually results in a lot of summarizing in the proposal uh, that actually we have done that. So is, it, uh, is this guidance, then, that is going to be directed to the small community bankers going to have to look at this and interpret the 1,099 pages to be able to determine what the terms of that Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act document mean? Well, they've had extensive input into the forms, which are What's the purpose of this? What will the small community banker do with this document? Because we know with 1,099 pages, there is an expectation, or at least litigators will expect there's an expectation, that they have read and reviewed and understand the implications of every term within it. But only a small portion of that is the actual rule. Much of it is the kind of explanation, procedure, detail, analysis that Congress has told us they want to require before we can write a rule. So when we go and do all of that detailed analysis and present it, cost-benefit analysis, I don't think that a, a small bank has to be conversant with our cost-benefit analysis, but it's something that's required of us to justify the rule. Uh, so uh, again, uh, to, to complain that the agency needs to be very careful and thorough uh, in, in its process of developing the proposals for rules, and this is a proposal, it's not the final rule, uh, and then to, then to complain because all of that amounts to a, a lot of pages, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. Also, we're told over and over again by industry that they prefer specificity. They don't want us to write a short rule. It's kind of counterintuitive for me. They don't want us to write a short rule where there's lots of things that have to be interpreted and end up going into the courts and have to be interpreted how? Through litigation, through hiring lawyers and having them, uh, you know, bring cases that obviously... But I think I, I, I don't want to step on your explanation because I appreciate this and yeah. I do think it's, and I know my time is up, but I, as a, an attorney, my concern is it's just this which will create more litigation because you know yourself as a former uh, a government attorney the, the ability to, to, to look at specific cases and then find distinctions and ask why we didn't apply you know, those particular circumstances to the decision was made creates a litigator's dream. 
uh, again, uh, a short rule that's general and vague will leave a lot of things mushy, and there will be a lot of things that will have to be litigated because it's the only way you can get things resolved. Uh, industry tells us they want us to avoid that. They want us to be very specific. Specificity often means greater length. You know, it's, it's a dilemma. It's a challenge. It's something that we're working through. But we're trying to work it through. I want to stress with a lot of input from the small providers you're talking about, thinking about how these rules affect them, thinking about when we can impose exemptions or, or, or thresholds. You know, ultimately, uh, you're the one, you were a referee, right? Right. You know, ultimately, you know, we do the best we can. We have to make a call. People are going to criticize us on both sides of it. Were we too thorough and therefore too long? Were we not thorough enough and therefore uh, subject to challenge on that uh, front? But, uh, you know, we, times we will take this input back, and, and uh, it's something we, we wrestle with every day. So. Thank you. I, I appreciate your, your willingness to answer completely, but uh, from this side of the dais, a, a thousand page rulemaking in order to get a three page disclosure document seems, seems a, a little more than on the excessive side. Uh, we'll recognize Mr. Welch of uh, Vermont. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cordray, I remember your first appearance before our full committee and I asked you about rulemaking and whether you preferred simple and understandable to complex and confusing. Any change in heart about that? I still prefer simple and understandable. Uh, when you have complex subjects, uh, what industry tells us is sometimes they prefer more specific right. nailing everything down so that there's less uncertainty uh, and less to litigate about. Oh, good. Uh, you know, I, I find myself in sympathy with a lot of the concerns that were expressed by Mr. Gunta and Mr. Mann, uh, but I think in Congress we're, we're mixing up some of the issues here. Uh, on this question of the Dodd-Frank regulations, uh, there's two issues. One is I think all of us recognize that what makes sense for a regulatory regime for Wall Street and these huge institutions is quite a bit different than our small community banks that really didn't contribute to the problem. Uh, so I think all of us would much prefer to not have these regulations be overbroad so the banks that are just doing their local work and, and didn't cause the problem don't get swept up. But second, one of the questions that we duck here uh, is on these big banks, whether in fact they're too big to regulate. Uh, will they find, no matter what we write, no matter what we do, they'll find some way to get around it. Uh, and I, for one, think that uh, uh, on things like derivatives, where J.P. Morgan, for instance, had a, an exposure of $77 trillion, instead of regulating, would it make sense uh, to require them to put more cash into the transaction so that there would just be a very compelling institutional interest uh, to minimize risk rather than uh, in, in, in great risk. And I say that for my colleagues because I actually think that's one way to try to deal with these institutions that are too big to regulate. Uh, but the third point is that my understanding of your institution is that it's going to be there to try to protect consumers against some of the practices that have really hurt them. And uh, I've talked to small businesses and heard things that Mr. Gunter heard. But uh, I suspect you've talked to individuals who've also explained to you how comp confusing it is for them to deal with banks, or parents, how confusing it is to deal with, that, deal with student loan forms. And uh, I just want to go over a couple of things that you, your, your organization did do that I think are terrific. Uh, the CFPB created a new student loan assessment uh, tool to help students and their families evaluate the cost of college. And that, I think, is really good. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and what its reception has been? Uh, sure. In fact, uh, there have been uh, institutions across the country representing over a million students already who have adopted the financial aid shopping sheet, which is a simplified version and a uniform and comparable version of what kind of financial aid offer you're getting uh, when you're trying to decide where to go to college and trying to understand, which has been difficult for people to understand, exactly what it's going to cost, what kind of payment schedule you're going to come out of college with, uh, whether you're going to be able to afford that, what kind of rights you may have if you have trouble uh, with repaying the loans uh, and the like. So I think that has been a success. It's the kind of thing that we're trying to do where I think most people, if they have a young person in their family who has recently uh, been 
trying to finance a higher education okay. uh, understand and have dealt with, they need to know very clearly before they make the decision right. what they're getting into and so they won't have regrets. Let me go on to one other. I mean, in addition to your settlement with Capital One where there really was revealed ripoff practices and you were successful in getting return to consumers over $150, $160 million in addition to the penalty. Uh, is your organization working to simplify uh, credit card co contracts so folks uh, don't have a blizzard uh, of eye popping uh, and bone tearing uh, uh, contract provisions to read? So it's just all simple and understandable. We, we are trying to do that, and we're having some success with that. And I think industry is beginning to see the merits of that as well. We're not proceeding by a compulsory rulemaking there. Uh, we have uh, model forms that we're, uh, we're proposing for people, and more and more are, are moving in that direction. Maybe at some point we would need to regulate. But the idea is to keep it simple for people. They can't absorb a 60, 70-page credit card agreement. They end up getting ambushed right. and trapped by the and, fine print. And one of the things that some of my small bankers who have been the backbone in our community lending program have told me is, Peter, just tell us what the rules are. And then we'll compete on what those rules are. So yep. simplification works in their view for them as well as for consumers. Any comment about that? And then my, then my time will be expired. It, it's my instinct from my background uh, as a treasurer at the county and state level that if community banks are able to compete on a level playing field with the larger banks, uh, they will do better because they have superior customer service. Uh, and and that is what people really want from a financial institution. Uh, so I, I think it's important for us to keep that playing field level uh, and also recognize, uh, as was noted earlier, that uh, compliance burdens fall more heavily on a small institution and therefore to the extent we can lighten the load or exempt them at times from things we should uh, look for opportunities where that's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Amash of Michigan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Cordray, for coming back to oversight. I'm going to yield my time back to the Chairman. Thanks. Certainly appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Cordray, um, in uh, April of this year, in Bulletin 2012-04, the CFPB uh, outlined um, uh, their views on fair lending and how to pursue actions related to that. You're familiar with this memo? I am. Okay. Um, and in this memo, the CFPB adopted the legal doctrine of disparate impact. Uh, many view this as a controversial legal theory uh, that uh, takes intent out of uh, viewing discriminatory actions and simply uses statistical research uh, and, um, to, to prove out discriminatory actions. Is that right? The, the CFPB intends to use disparate impact? Uh, we adopted <clears throat> the same position that all of the bank regulators have taken for 20 years, but the CFPB being a new uh, agency had not yet spoken on that issue. So we wanted to clarify that we do join our fellow regulators in viewing disparate impact as law of the land that uh, we should follow. And you are familiar with press reports uh, about the City of St. Paul's uh, uh, court case uh, and the Department of Justice uh, uh, perhaps pressuring the City of St. Paul to withdraw that uh, uh, lawsuit? On I, I, I don't know how familiar I am with all the details of that. That's sort of outside our ambit. Uh, it was not a case under one of the statutes that we enforce, but I understand there was a case and ultimately it was resolved uh, 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 through a settlement, is my understanding. Okay. Well, you know, uh, we're uh, this subcommittee is investigating uh, whether or not the Department of Justice uh, pressured the City of St. Paul to withdraw that lawsuit. I see. Uh, through intermediaries uh, of sorts, uh, uh, because of the Department of Justice concern um, that the, the the court would would have struck down uh, disparate impact as a is a legal doctrine, uh, a valid legal doctrine for the government to use. If, I see. That, that would involve overruling prior decisions, uh, but of course okay. that's, that's so the court's have, prerogative. Have you or any of your staff had contact with uh, Assistant Attorney General Perez uh, about disparate impact? Uh, Actually, let me start by saying, have you had any uh, contact with Assistant Attorney General Perez about uh, disparate impact? I, I happen to know Assistant Attorney General Perez. Uh, He's related by marriage to a woman who worked with me when I was a Ohio Attorney General, so that's when I first heard his name. Uh, uh, 
and I've had, we, you know, we've had dealings with him uh, in our as our agency deals with fair lending matters, and he is, I believe, he's the head of civil rights. So I, th I think uh, there probably has been uh, a fair amount of contact there in the normal course of the work that we do. Yes. Okay. Uh, I would ask you to submit for the record, um, uh, you know, those contacts and whether or not they they have entailed uh, uh, it discussions of the use of disparate impact. Uh, when it, uh, in dealing with fair lending practices. I'm, I'm sure our staff will be happy to work with your staff on, on that. Um. Uh, okay. And, and, you know, it, as it relates to all this, um, because disparate impact requires showing no intent uh, to discriminate, <clears throat> lenders have no way of knowing um, whether or not their practices could be subject to future fair lending uh, suits. Um, so do you think that that adds to uncertainty? And is there any way for the CFPB to allay those fears? Does it add to uncertainty? I, I think it's, it's been the law of the land for more than 20 years. So to the extent it's adding to uncertainty, it hasn't really changed in the last 20 years, maybe 25 years. This is the same test that's used, it's called the effects test, that's used in employment discrimination cases as well. It's the same framework. I think it was adapted into the fair lending context again more than 20 years ago. So I think it's established law. I don't know that that's adding to uncertainty. I think uncertainty would be about whether the established law is going to be changed. Uh, as you say, it's always within the prerogative of the Supreme Court to change the law if they see fit to do so, but uh, that would be a change in law and that would, I, I guess, be a subject of uncertainty if that were to occur. Uh, Ms. Maloney of New York is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for calling this uh, uh, hearing and, and uh, welcome Doc, uh, Director Cordray. And, uh, I, I was reading the testimony of, of one of the panelists that's to come, and that's the uh, Cato Institute and uh, uh, Mark Calabria's uh, testimony. And on page three, he says, and I quote, that the spread of rates on credit card loans has remained wide since the end of 2008, in part because of price adjustments made in response to provisions in the Card Act, end quote. But he failed to acknowledge the Federal Reserve's footnote. He was talking about a Federal Reserve report that I have here, in which the Federal Reserve says, quote, the widening of these spreads is due to the restrictions the CARD Act placed on issuers' ability to impose certain fees and protecting consumers, uh, end quote. And uh, I, I would like a unanimous consent to place in the record uh, the Federal Reserve's full statement on this, uh, hide, highlighting uh, the fact that I just met, just said, and, and also it... Without objection. It, it also goes on to say that stopping such abuses such as raising rates any reason retroactively on balances, uh, giving the consumer the uh, power to opt in to higher rates if they so approve, uh, uh, stopping certain tricks and traps of changing the rates of a... Uh, of, uh, of, 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 uh, charging uh, on interest that's already been paid and other things that were happening, uh, I would say that the CARD Act has gone a long way towards protecting consumers uh, from abusive, unfair, and anti-competitive actions, and uh, that in some cases the industry has raised rates in order to raise their own revenues. I'd like your comments on that, and uh, I would also say the CARD Act has given many consumers many more uh, choices uh, to go to providers that have a lower interest rate. Uh, but would you uh, comment from your own experience on how the CARD Act is impacting issuers, consumers, the overall uh, economy? I can say from my point of view, I don't get complaints from consumers anymore about their credit cards. They seem better able to manage their credit. Apparently, there are fewer people walking away from their credit cards and leaving that burden on the, on the issuers, and that it's overall been a success. But uh, your, your comments, please, Mr. Cordray, on what you are finding in your new, new position, and congratulations on the transparency that you're bringing to consumers. Thank you, thank you Congresswoman. Uh, on the CARD Act in particular, we gathered together credit card issuers and, and uh, had a transmittal of information for them early in our 
uh, early in our time to assess how the CARD Act had affected the credit card industry. And, and we judged based on, uh, on the evidence we were able to amass that it has had a positive success, uh, effect on the industry, positive effect for consumers. It has not unduly constrained uh, uh, access to uh, credit card credit. Uh, those those initiations are growing. Again, uh, tremendous amount of solicitation going on out of the market. I think credit card issuers have adapted to that. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand, but I guess you're going to submit for the record the notion that the CARD Act would have widened spreads in 2008, given that the CARD Act didn't pass until 2009. So, uh, you know, I'm not <laughs> sure how all the dates work together uh, on that. But um, in any event, in our view, the CARD Act, from what we've seen so far, has been both successful in, in reining in some of the uh, excesses that were uh, hurting consumers, but at the same time, the Credit card issuers have been able to work with that, uh, have implemented it successfully, and are initiating a tremendous amount of credit card uh, uh, availability of credit for uh, individual consumers in the marketplace as we speak. And, and as you might notice, delinquencies are, have been down. Uh, delinquencies are down, uh, <clears throat> but still there's over a trillion dollars in credit card debt in our nation, um, mm -hmm. which, um, which speaks to... Uh, uh, many many Americans being in debt. Can you do you believe that that over time the Credit Card Act will bring down that indebtedness, or do you believe it will? It, it, it may. I, I don't want to speculate too much as to cause and effect. I think the crisis has brought down uh, credit card debt as people have the savings rate has jumped up again, and people have been paying down. Uh, debt. I also think we should note that credit cards are a tremendous convenience for consumers. I mean, the ability to engage in a transaction without having ready cash, uh, because credit cards are, are the medium and the means of, of effectuating those transactions, is very important for people and has created a tremendous amount of uh, convenience for consumers that they appreciate, that they value, that they're willing to pay for. Uh, again, they should pay for it in a clear-eyed way. They should understand the prices and risks of their credit card account. Uh, much of that has been achieved, greater transparency through the CARD Act. Uh, we, again, view it as a success. We'll continue to monitor uh, its effects. We are, as you know, taking credit card complaints on our website and compiling those and taking a look at those. And I would say that there are many areas that we're not getting many complaints on that I think that before the CARD Act we would have received a tremendous number of complaints on. So There were 60,000 responses to the Fed's um, uh, questions on it during the review process. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, Ms. Burkle of New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this hearing, and thank you to Mr. Cordray for being here this morning. Uh, my first line of question, uh, it has to do with retrospective analysis and whether or not the uh, CFPB is going to conduct or if it's currently conducting any res retrospective review of its regulations just in order to determine the consequences uh, on the consumers as well as any regulated entities. So, so retrospective analysis? Yeah, this is one of the things that uh, I've testified in front of this committee before and, and others, I, I think was missed by, uh, by the regulators previously. And it's something we should be attentive to, which is you can, you can keep adopting individual rules, and in each case it's well-meaning, and in each case there's reasons why it would make sense that that would be protective of people. Uh, and you can kind of forget over time about the aggregate burden those rules create, and you add more and more. Uh, you know how, how much? How much does that do for people? So that's why the. I, I don't mean to be rude. My, the five minutes. I've never seen five minutes go by so quickly okay. when, when <laughs> one's answering Sorry questions. That. Sure. So that's a no. I mean, you're you're acknowledging that they should be done, but they're not being done. No, no. We we actually one of the things we did. We're not required to do this, but we thought it made sense. Was we launched a streamlining initiative to consider the, all the rules that we inherited. We didn't write. M the rules that we inherited from other agencies, so we're not invested in them. And we've asked people to give us their input into what do you think could be streamlined, what could be cut back, what could be eliminated without hurting consumer protection, uh, in what ways could the same protection be delivered at less burden for institutions. We've gotten a lot of good uh, input on that. We're digesting that, and we will uh, be looking to streamline rules. I think that's important. Okay. Uh, Maya, my concern is that you're looking at the entities that are affected by this and you're making sure that those, and that's really my concern, not whether it's coordinated or whether the, the uh, yeah. in the aggregate, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. whether these rules are affecting 
either the consumer or the affected entity um, by Dodd Frank. Mm -hmm. So, is that being done, or is it considered? Is it going to be considered? So, as we go forward with new rules, yes, that is a consideration that we have and are required to to undertake. Uh, we are conducting small business review panels so that we hear directly from small providers and get their input at a very early stage when we're still formulating proposals. And that's been useful for us, I would say. We weren't sure what to make of that to begin with. It was an additional burden for us, but I think it actually has been positive. So if I could, for the purposes of this hearing this morning, uh, would you commit to to uh, adopting formal procedures that will for a retrospective review of all of the CFP, uh, FPB uh -huh. rules, uh, including a specific uh, review of how the rules are affecting credit access? I, I see. And I should have said this earlier. Uh, in our law, and I'm glad it's in our law, I think it makes sense, we are required with any rule we adopt to review it again after five years to consider whether it's actually having the impact that we intended for it to have, whether there are unintended consequences, whether there are burdens we didn't appreciate at the time. We'll be hearing from the institutions. Uh, obviously, we hear from them all the time as we go. But at a minimum, every five years, we have to do that. And so that won't be just a sort of mindless accumulation of rules uh, over time without regard to what that does for institutions. I, I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that there's not going to be a look at these new rules that are going into place and have gone into place because of Dodd-Frank, mm -hmm. whether the CFPB is willing to and will agree to today to make sure that those rules the, that you understand and you do a retrospective review, not going forward, not trying to figure out how you should proceed in the future, but actually looking at what has been done, the rules that are in place, and how they're affecting not only the consumer, but also the, the agencies that are being affected by this law. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, in terms of our corner of the world, uh, we both are engaged in a streamlining initiative looking retrospectively at rules we inherited. And with every rule that we propose, not only do we get tremendous input as we, as we work through it, but uh, at a minimum, uh, every five years we will engage in that retrospective analysis of those rules. So I do think it's built into the process for us. Uh, but again, if, if, if I'm not quite uh, satisfying your line of questioning, I'd be happy to have our staff work with your staff to understand further just, just what you'd like to see from us. Yeah, I'd like to see in the statute the five-year commitment, but also uh, is five years too long a period of time? I think for some it may be. For others it's, it may not, it may be even too quick, but uh, I think it's probably a good compromise. I mean, it's hard to draw those lines. Congress drew it. I, I don't have a quarrel with the way they drew it. So. I see my time has expired, and I didn't get to my last two questions. Thank you, okay. Mr. Cordray. I'm not uh, thank you, Mr. Cordray. It will now recognize Mr. Kelly of Pennsylvania uh, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Cordray, nice to have you in front of us again. Uh, Mr. Meehan had talked about this, and I did. We printed out this uh, get to know your borrower. Uh, information. This is 1,100 pages. You said 1099, so we're not going to make a big deal about one page. But the people that I get a chance to talk to when I go back in, in the third district of Pennsylvania are small banks. Now, while it may be easier for big banks to comply with this because they have huge numbers of people on board that can go through this stuff and sift through it, the, today's hearing was the credit crunch is the CFPB restricting consumer access to credit. So actually, 40 pages of this are actually the cost-benefit analysis. But the rest of it, these people have to know. And so for the small banks, we may say, listen, you know, it's, they're going to be okay. They're going to get through it. And, and I've got to the point where the too big to fail means you're too small to survive. And for anybody to suggest that there's any way that small banks and small lending institutions can go through this same process and come out at the other end, being able to offer the products they've offered before, is ludicrous. Now, where I come from, we rely on the small banks and the, and the, the uh, the credit unions. And I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm, I'm talking to guys who I grew up with, went to school with, our wives know each other, our kids know each other, and yet they have to sit down and get to know who their borrower is and what a qualified borrower is. And I'm just, is, does this make any sense to anybody? You talk about these are common sense solutions or reforms that are going to make it easier. It's not making it easier. It's making it more difficult. Access to credit can't be done over a long period of time. People need it now. If you need a transfusion of capital, you need it now. 
When you go to these small institutions and these small banks and they say, you know, you know what, I'm not sure that I can do this for you anymore. They're opting out of offering products that they've always offered before. And the reason they're doing it is because they're not sure that they can survive what we're putting them through right now. I'm not blaming you for this. But I'm saying, well, you know, while the patient's waiting for the people to do the diagnosis, they're dying. Access to capital is critical to small businesses. We're talking about an environment where we're trying to get job creators back online. You know what's keeping them away? Is uncertainty. They don't even know if they can borrow money anymore. Heck, I'm an automobile dealer. You know, I don't know. My covenant changes every quarter. My collateral changes all the time. What used to be acceptable collateral is no longer acceptable collateral. The people I used to go for, to for money right now say, you know what? Sorry, I, we can't help you because we're still trying to sift through the regulations. So while this may have been well intended to start with, I mean, where you're sitting, please tell me, is it going to be easier for access to credit or harder? It's just easier or harder. Okay, so uh, first of all, I think there's some easier apples and oranges harder. here. No, it's not apples and oranges. It's access okay. to credit. It's not apple. Is it easier or harder for small banks to lend money right now? Okay. The reason it's been difficult for small banks to My lend money for the last four harder. years. I'm just asking you to use your heart, Mr. Cordray. Okay. I, I, I don't need, I'm just asking you what the time is. I don't want you to build me a watch. Okay. Since 2008, it's been harder for small banks it's much to lend harder. money. That's it's right. much harder. Since 2008. So uh, correct. they are merchants. Banks are merchants. They have money on the shelf to lend to people. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. So when we make it harder for people like me, small businessmen, to have access to credit, if it's harder to get credit, it's harder to stay alive. And that's my whole point about this. Mm -hmm. In an environment where we want people to survive, we want people to go ahead and take that jump, go out and borrow the money, they can't go to the traditional lenders because the traditional lenders cannot sift through this. That's not it's, the cause, I don't believe, sir. Uh, since 2008, it's been hard for smaller banks to lend. That's because we had a financial crisis and a crash Mr. of the Gordry, system. I, I, I exist in that world, okay? Mm -hmm. I know how hard it is to, to survive in the real world. Only inside this beltway do we come up with, with solutions that are so difficult that nobody can pull the trigger anymore. So the purpose of this hearing was, is it, are we are restricting consumer access to credit? And the answer is yes, we are. We're making it so hard for the small banks and, the, and the, the credit unions to lend money. The rest of this is just, we're just tap dancing around the outside of this. It is so difficult for these people. They're going out of business. Would you like me to respond or just listen? Which would you prefer? Well, I, I would like you to listen. And I would like this administration to listen because I'll tell you what, they've got a deaf ear when it comes to what's really going on in the private sector. I can appreciate where you came from. In my business, we have to survive every day. We go in hand-to-hand -hand combat every day to survive. I do not need 1,100 pages from a guy that I've known all my life to tell me whether I'm qualified or not. That's the whole purpose of this. There's no answer to it. Okay. It's yeah. government red tape that's keeping this, this economy from recovering. I, and I, I'm out of time. I'm out of time, but I'm not out of energy. I came here to fight for people who are out in the common world, the private world, and that's what we have to continue to do. Mr. Chairman, thanks for having this hearing. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cordray, if you wish to respond, I'll give you the time. Sure. Uh, we're not asking anybody to give you 1,100 pages. Uh, this is making forms simpler and clearer so that people can understand the prices and risks of credit. Uh, that should be good for the system. We did not do that uh, in 2006, 7, and 8. The system crashed and burned. All these small institutions were hurt. Many, a number of them failed. Uh, we now need to improve that process. What you're telling me and what I need to hear from you uh, is, as we improve the process, don't make things worse for these institutions. It's already hard enough. Uh, we're trying to be mindful of that uh, every day. Uh, but people who want us to go through a very, very thorough rulemaking process, uh, you know, it becomes a lengthy process, you know, then want to complain that it's a lengthy process and it's, it's a lot of pages. Uh, in the end, the rule part of that is a small part of that, of that pile. Uh, the forms are going to be simpler and clearer and more uniform, uh, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Something Congress has been asking for for 20 years. The agencies weren't able to do it. We're now doing it. Uh, I hope that's a step forward, but I'm interested in your input. I appreciate it, and, and we're happy to hear it uh, anytime as we go. We hear from the same institutions you're hearing from, and I hear the same things. Well, while well, well, we debate, they're dying. So. We'll, we'll now recognize for a second round the Vice Chairman, Mr. Genta. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh -huh. 
Mr. Cordray, I am not sure that Congress for the last 20 years has been asking for 1,000 pa pages of guidance to a rule. I think maybe what Congress has been asking for is a, uh, a term that was used by Mr. Welch and by you as well, simpler process. So while the form might have been contracted to one to two pages, the guidance with that form in many circumstances appears to be you know, a thousand pages. And that, I think, is the concern that community banks and credit unions have moving forward, is will the guidance along with these forms be so uh, large that they have a choice between dealing with the regulator as they hire, hire a compliance officer, mm -hmm. or hiring someone who can grow and expand their business. Mm -hmm. So when you say that you want to listen to our input, our input would be if you're trying to make things simpler in terms of the forms, that's, that's a good goal, but the guidance also needs to be simpler. I think is probably what you're hearing from okay. from both sides of the aisle. I want to read from testimony that will be given later by um, Mr. Fetcher, who is uh, represents the Credit Union National Association. Uh, page three of his testimony, he says, "Every dollar of credit union, uh, every dollar of credit union spends complying with these changes is a dollar that is not spent to the benefit of credit union members." And he goes on to say, because credit unions are member-owned financial cooperatives, the entire cost of compliance is ultimately borne by credit union members. So my concern is that additional compliance over regulation will feed into uh, a credit union or a small community bank's inability to, to lend in the future. How, can you just talk to me again about how you will balance what you view as Congress's mandate to the, in, to the CFPB in consumer pr pr protection and the reality of those consumers needing that direct access to those community banks and those credit unions? So one of the ways in which we're trying to balance that is by getting direct input from the community banks and credit unions to understand uh, their circumstances. And I, I know uh, from my dealings with them that there are quite a number of uh, credit unions in particular that involve very, very few employees, uh, maybe less than 10, not even less than 100, less than 10. Uh, and it is our view that where we can potentially exempt them from uh, burdens, that we should look for the opportunity to do so, that they follow a traditional business model that's very high touch with their customers that isn't necessarily requiring making it subject to all of the things that we do for the larger, uh, more remote, uh, more volume uh, banks. So that's something that we're trying to keep in mind as we uh, draft regulations and we figure out how they should apply. But we're also, again, we're keeping a very open line of communication. We hear, I think we hear from the same institutions that you hear from. Uh, I, I invite the community banks uh, to come see us and we go see them as we go around the country. Uh, and we're trying to be mindful of this uh, as we go. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the cost of a failure of compliance was a financial crisis, a crash of the system that killed a lot of banks and a lot of credit unions that folded up because you can't operate within a system when credit's not flowing anywhere. Uh, and again, that happened in 2007, 2008, long before the CFPB came on the scene. But, but was it uh, the entire system or were, 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 were they individual actors? Because right now, the CFPB is, is, seems to be going after the entire system rather than necessarily individual bad actors. I, I think that's a good question, actually. But I think it's a combination. I think there were, there were a lot of bad actors. Uh, many of them were enabled by a system that allowed them to operate fairly freely because we were regulating part, for example, of the mortgage market and not regulating part at all. Uh, I think that. Uh, obviously, uh, what you're suggesting is we want vigorous enforcement of the laws to weed out the bad actors. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the question is, uh, what additional regulations are needed? Are they really needed? Well, to well, extent, well let, yeah. me, let me clarify what I'm saying then, because yeah, that's not necessary. Sure. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I read earlier somewhere that part of 
the focus of Dodd-Frank. Here it is. Congress has directed the Bureau to identify and address outdated, unnecessary, and unduly burdensome regulations in order yeah. to reduce unwarranted regulatory burden. That's Section 1021b3. Uh, yes. I would love it if you focused on that, because I do continue to hear from those community banks and those um, credit unions about, particularly, the, and, I'm, and I'm talking about those smaller individuals who are helping those, those, those people that are our friends, our neighbors who live in our communities. And I'm glad that you mentioned the size of credit unions. We have 7,200 credit unions. Half of them are 10 or less. You know, you're seeing up to 300 a year merge into larger credit unions. That doesn't help the consumer get greater access um, and, and greater flexibility to the market. It constricts it. So the idea here is going back to that one component of Dodd-Frank that says, look, we got a responsibility to reduce regulation is where you know, I would like to see uh, the CFPB uh, focus its attention. I yield back. Uh, thank the, uh, uh, I thank the Vice Chairman. I will now recognize Mr. Quigley, the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Corder, just to review, let's, let's just, we're all concerned about community banks and their unique roles in our communities. But let's just let you restate, what do you see the exact role your agency has in, in addressing the issues that you were created for as it relates to community banks and how that's different from the larger banks? So uh, our job is to protect consumers, but in the financial marketplace, which is a difficult marketplace for the average consumer. Uh, but we intend and wish to do that in a balanced way. Uh, we want to uh, both make it possible for consumers to better understand the decisions they're making, make prices and risks clear, uh, allow them to make more informed decisions because the consumer will make the best decision if they have the information to do so. Nobody can do that for them. Uh, as for the providers, uh, they have to be able to provide credit. That's, that's important. And they have to be able to do it in an, an easily understandable way. Uh, and the conditions under which uh, smaller banks and credit unions operate are very different, I think. That's been my experience from the largest volume banks, the very large banks that we immediately oversee uh, and enforce the law against that have $10 billion in assets or more and a multitude uh, of employees. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to balance uh, uh, both a regulatory regime that is taking account of the problems that consumers have had in these different financial markets, uh, but is also trying to understand that if uh, community banks and credit unions are following a traditional business model of very high touch, very uh, knowledgeable about their customers, good customer service to their customers, uh, that they may or may not have to be subject to all the same requirements uh, as the larger banks that uh, operate at more of a distance, uh, somewhat more of an, an anonymous uh, and, and volume-driven, statistical-driven uh, models of lending. Uh, so that's, that's a balance that we need to try to strike, and we're, we're trying to strike, in particular, with lots of input from the institutions that are affected. And so far, what have you put in place at, as it relates to small banks? I mean, has, has, have any other rules passed? I mean, that you, have you completed? Uh, we've, we've only had two uh, uh, final rules. One was a status quo placeholder while we consider the matter further. The other is the remittance rule, which uh, was finalized in February, it does not take effect until February of 2013, so it hasn't even uh, gone into force uh, for any institution yet. Uh, all the rest of it is uh, anxiety and concern and, and hypothetical. Uh, Nonetheless, I, I take that it's very real in a lot of bankers' minds, and so we take it seriously. We're trying to understand it. But we have, you know, tangible rules that have been put into effect. There's been minimal uh, impact on institutions to date. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. We'll now recognize Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Quadre, I do accept the objective of trying to simplify things. I'm just in the brief few moments that I've been looking at this. It reminds me of trying to build a gas grill. 
<laughs> and we've all been through that once. Yeah, I don't like the <laughs> instruction booklets myself. <laughs> no. but, but, you know, here's H24A, Mortgage Loan Transaction Loan Estimate. This is the blank form. This is a blank loan estimate that illustrates the application of the content requirements of Section 1026.37, which implies there's about a thousand other uh, sections before that. This form provides two variations of page one, four variations of page two, and eight variations of page three, reflecting the variable content requirements in 1026.37. Then I've got to go back to 1026.37. What I'm suggesting to you is the complexity of this is overwhelming, but that's not where I think I want to use a couple of the minutes. M many of the local bankers are concerned about the qualified mortgage definition and whether we're going to get into new kinds of litigation possibilities. And I think you've spent some time, and I'd like to ask for your help in defining where we think this is going to go on the definition uh, re regarding whether there's going to be a safe harbor interpretation or whether or not there's going to be a, a rebuttable presumption. And my reading of what the rebuttable presumption is, is that in addition to the factual information, there's a series of almost extrinsic evidence that could be introduced about the nature of that transaction. So where do we think this is going to be going with regard to the definition of a qualified mortgage? So uh, the uh, qualified mortgage rule, which is about the uh, consumer's ability to repay the mortgage, which was something that uh, far too little attention was paid to in the lead up to the financial crisis, and it led to many bad mortgages being uh, peddled. Uh, that failed, that failed in securitizations that brought down uh, the financial system. Uh, the idea here, Congress has required that this rule be uh, be adopted. Uh, the Federal Reserve uh, put forward an initial proposal that then transferred to us, which we've inherited and we are, are working on uh, to finalize. Uh, the idea is that there will be a a realm of qualified mortgages that if they meet certain characteristics, there doesn't have to be any attention to ability to repay because the protective features of those mortgages themselves uh, should should accomplish that. And there will be other mortgages outside of that uh, definition, the non-qualified mortgages, if you will, uh, where they will have to document uh, attention to the uh, consumer's ability to repay. It is It has been conveyed to us loudly and, and clearly by people across the spectrum that if the qualified mortgage realm is drawn too narrowly, uh, that could uh, upset the mortgage market. That would be a, uh, a notable example of a rule itself potentially ac restricting access to credit. We're very concerned about uh, making sure that we don't uh, do that. So we have actually backed up our timing on this rule to consider it further. We gained quite a bit of data from FHFA about mortgages. Uh, there's a lot of law that if you if you gain significant new data and you're going to rest a rule on that, you should give people an opportunity to have input and comment on it, which we have have been doing over the. Do course you expect of the much summer. lending outside of the of the? category of what you would call a qualified mortgage? It's hard to know what may happen in the long run with the mortgage market, but what's been conveyed to us and what we're pretty much convinced by is that in the short run, in the next couple, three years, which of course we're all living in the short run, uh, there is unlikely to be a lot of lending done outside of the qualified mortgage circle. And therefore, it's pretty important for us to be more inclusive in terms of what comes within uh, that circle. And that's that's all input that we're uh, digesting and trying to take into account as we finalize that rule before the end of this year. There's two. There's a provision in the bill that talks about a three-day window and terms changing during the course of a transaction requiring a new disclosure. I'm concerned and discussed with bankers that you may get to a point where you're getting towards the end of a transaction, what could be the normal discussion in the course of a uh, a negotiation about who may be responsible for fixing a basement or something could change the yep. terms, which will require a whole new uh, period of disclosure that may start the process ticking again, which may impact the availability of the credit that's, that's guaranteed on that particular day. Is there a way in which there's going to be some flexibility created to allow there to be some movement within the terms of a transaction without having it be 
triggering a whole new set of disclosures. So, so thank you, Congressman. Now you're talking about a different rule, which is the uh, uh, the no before you owe Truth and Lending Act RESPA form rule. Uh, and part of the proposal there, and it's it's merely at a proposal stage at this point, we're going to get people's input on it, is that people not be ambushed at the closing table, that they get these disclosures three days before they close, so they have time to actually review it. Uh, you know how the pressure comes at the closing table. There's all the information there. Much of it is required by state law, not by, not by the feds. Uh, much of it is required by the lending institutions themselves for protection. Uh, and people are being pushed, pushed to just sign, 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 not read it, not understand it. Uh, the notion here is that if people can have the information, the key information three days before, uh, that gives them a better ability to understand and gauge the transaction they're entering into. Uh, we want to try to minimize the impact uh, that that could have on potentially uh, uh, tying up a transaction from occurring on the date, the expected date. So that's something we're trying to take account of and, and get input on through the proposal stage, which is where we are right now. So your, your, your comment, which is similar to comments we've heard from others, are things we're trying to take account of and understand how we can avoid uh, having that effect. Although we do think it's very important for consumers to have some, some time to look at this. It's the biggest single transaction they're likely ever to engage in. Uh, and if they do it in a confused basis or a rushed basis, uh, where they don't quite understand what they're getting into, they can make bad decisions that, that will haunt them the rest of their lives and will lead to a bad transaction. Well, thank you, Ina. I hope that you'll look for flexibility with regard to that. Now, just one last issue that I ask that you spend time considering is the implication on small and medium-sized institutions with regard to requirements for machine readability of documents and the cost that may be associated with whole new kinds of information systems that will have to be obtained in order to do that. Um, I'm hearing a lot about that question. Uh, thank you, Congressman. We are too, and we're going to uh, we're going to look for how we can uh, try to accommodate those concerns. Thank you. Yep. Another gentlelady from New York is recognized, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just have to comment because as I've been sitting here listening, there's two um, tones that really concern me, and one is condescension that the American people and the consumers and the small businesses who are trying to consume services from banks just can't do it without the federal government, just can't do it without a thousand pages directing them. And I think it's, first of all, it's condescension. But second of all, it's, it's such a, a 180 degrees from what this country is about. And we don't need the government. We don't need the government to, to take care of us. There are consumers, and this is the most well-informed consumer uh, world out there with the internet, with people doing their legal services online. There, yes, there are bad players. Yes, there are, there are, but, and I will just go to my uh, colleague's comment about this regulation and this whole approach looks at all of the institutions if they're, as if they're the enemy and they're the cause of this meltdown that we had in 2008. And it doesn't, it's what government does best. It, it's one big fat footprint. We can't, we can't pick and choose the, the ones who were of, the f offenders and the ones who hurt the consumer versus the whole industry itself. And that's, that's always been my argument about government because it can't, it doesn't have the ability. It's one, it's, it's a thousand or two thousand pages at the whole industry and it impacts everyone. But the condescension that we can't do it without the federal government, we can't do it without Dodd-Frank, is I, I find particularly offensive and I think the American people out there, the American businessmen, are far more sophisticated than the federal government gives them credit for. I want to just With, go uh, back to... May I respond? Sure. With respect, I don't think there's anything condescending about my attitude toward these issues. Uh, I had been in these uh, meetings in the community where people have lost their homes, lost their jobs because of the financial meltdown we worked through in 2007, 2008. These are very real human problems for people. They're tragic problems. And that's, the, that's where the system got us. Uh, before we're now trying to clean it up. So the notion that everything is working just fine and just get the federal government out of the way, I think is not, 
is, is, is not something that can be squared with the facts. Uh, but there's nothing condescending about my attitude toward these problems. These are people's lives. People have been harmed and affected by what went on uh, in a financial crisis that was not of their making. They were innocent bystanders. Many people paid faithfully on their mortgages and found their homes underwater because there were 10 other foreclosures in their community because of bad lending. Uh, and that's the kind of problem we're looking to fix. And people need us to do that, and they want us to do that, and we're going to work hard to do it. But I will do it with your input and your thoughts and your perspective and try to keep them very much in mind. Thank you. And I think we could probably debate the rest of the morning what actually caused the meltdown and the fact that Dodd-Frank doesn't handle Fannie and Freddie, and those were a big piece of what happened in 2008. And I think mm -hmm. that that should be of concern to everyone. I just want to go uh, harken back to when you were here in January. Um, as we know, the CFPB is empowered to prevent unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices. Yeah. Uh, in, de in January, we asked, uh, and as you know, deceptive and unfair have been clearly defined in the statute. But as we get into the term abusive, and I'll just read you what you testified to in January, uh, we have determined, I quote, we have determined that this is going to have to be a fact and circumstance issue. It is not something we are likely to be able to define in the abstract. Do you, and that was when we asked you about the definition for abusive practices. Do you recall that statement? Uh, I, I do. And in fact, Congress defined the term abusive. It's in the Dodd-Frank Act. Congress provided a definition with multiple prongs as to what abuse it means. So I don't think the Bureau needs to redefine that. Congress told us what it means. If Congress says something, we accept it, we follow the law. Uh, in terms of how that applies in individual circumstances, obviously it has to be done with an eye to what those individual circumstances are. My, my time is running out. However, the CFPB exam examination manual clearly defines deceptive, clearly defines uh, unfair practices, pages and pages and pages. And yet there's only a paragraph on abusive. And that, that's what led to the question in January. And my concern with that vagueness, with, uh, which is what the regulators do, they define and they drill down into the law, um, my concern is that has a chilling effect. When you can't define what abusive practices are, how are the lenders supposed to know, the credit unions and the banks, how are they supposed to know what constitutes abusive practices? And, and in my mind, and my colleague mentioned it earlier, the uncertainty, the chilling effect that that vagueness will have on the industry. I see I've run out of time, so I yield back. I will now recognize Ms. Spear of California. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Mr. Cordray, um, my uh, plaudits to you for an outstanding job you have done as uh, you. the director. You know, for the longest time we've had a Consumer Product Safety Commission that could give us confidence that if we bought a toaster it wasn't going to blow up in our faces. But uh, we have not had that same confidence when it came to you know, credit card mortgages and the like. Now, the credit reporting agencies have been pretty mystifying to the American people. Um, they are not government entities. They are independent. And yet their numbers and the way they come up with their numbers says a lot to the consumers about whether they're going to get credit or not. And 700 used to be a great credit score, and now it's not good enough for most mortgages. Um, the FICO score, which we have known about for a long time, um, has also become the FACO score. Um, for some because, in fact, it's very unclear um, what scores are being used and that many of these credit reporting agencies have different scores uh, depending on uh, what product is uh, being uh, anticipated or uh, what you are paying for that score. So my first question to you, Mr. Cordray, um, you pointed out in a hearing last Monday in Detroit, and I quote, up to this point, no single federal government agency could access all the information necessary to generate a complete picture of what was happening inside these companies, end quote. Isn't it true that your supervision of credit reporting agencies has the potential to create a huge positive impact on some individual's ability to access credit. Could you explain? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I appreciate that uh, angle uh, on things. I, I do think, and we found as we held this field hearing in Detroit, that there are many people uh, who 
don't fully understand or maybe are even entirely unaware of how much impact on their lives that credit reporting agencies have. They're keeping score, they're keeping a file on you all the time. Every, every bill you pay or don't pay, whether you pay late or pay on time, uh, and that is now being used to determine whether you have access to credit at all, whether what kind of interest rate you have to pay to get access to credit, which may be very different for, for you than it is for me or for, for Mr. Kelly or anyone else, uh, and also uh, can affect things like whether you get hired for a job, as that's part of background checks now increasingly in a lot of uh, workplaces. So to the extent we can deliver more transparency, more accuracy, uh, in in credit report files that should be good for consumers and it should be good for lenders you know they pay for this service they pay for the credit report information uh, and if it's not accurate then lenders are harmed by that because they're making loans on terms that aren't the loan the terms they would have used had they had the accurate information so so I think it's a it's a very good point that as we can uh, work with the credit reporting agencies make sure that their processes are are as they should be uh, that they are accurately uh, pinpointing information and, and maintaining it, and that they're cleaning up errors that consumers bring to them in their file. Uh, that's good for consumers and lenders. It should be a win-win. All right. On July 17th, in the Washington Post column highlighting the importance of your work in this area, the column notes, and I quote, for years, consumer advocates have complained that the information collected often includes errors. Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Bureau and any businesses supplying them with data must correct inaccurate information. However, surveys have shown that getting erroneous information removed from credit files can be an exasperating experience. And let me tell you, I have personal experience um, with this issue, and it takes years. It shouldn't take years to correct an inaccurate credit report. Is this something that you're going to be able to address? Um, now having jurisdiction over the credit reporting agencies. Uh, we will. And it, frankly, I've had experience with that, too. And we had some legislative efforts in Ohio that I was involved in. And people have brought in their huge uh, boxes full of all the information and all the context that they had to try to get things corrected on their credit report, in many cases because they were victims of identity theft. So by definition, through no fault of their own. But it still can take months or even years to get this resolved. And it, a lot of hours of time sunk into this and, and lots of frustration. So uh, I do think that we're, we're going to be working with the credit reporting companies on, on three areas of concern that we identified. The kind of information they receive from others, which often can be uh, inaccurate or polluted in various ways, how they actually maintain and assemble that information, and what kind of error resolution procedures in place for consumers so that they aren't having to go through laborious hoops in order to get problems fixed that they did not create themselves. Mr. Chairman, can I ask one follow-up question? I realize my time has expired, but it will be a very short question. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, in California, we actually passed a law that required that if an employer was going to access your credit report as an applicant, that you had to be notified of that. Do we have a federal law that does that? That if someone's ac accessing your credit report, you have to be notified of it? If you are an applicant for a, a job and an employer is accessing your credit report, that you have to be notified. I, I don't believe that that's uh, addressed in federal law. Thank you. I, it could be wrong. I think, I think so we'll clean it up, but I don't believe so. Um, We've got a lot of federal statutes, so uh, <laughs> it's true. certainly a challenge. But um, yeah. uh, I'll now recognize myself for uh, questions. Um, the the headcount at the CFPB is roughly uh, at this point uh, around thirteen hundred people. Is that is that about right? Uh, no, actually, we're not at that level. Uh, we plan to grow to at least that level, but I think right now we're at more like nine fifty. Nine. Okay. Okay. Uh, 942 was the 2012 estimate, and I, I wasn't sure if you'd moved into uh, the 2013. Uh, it, what you outlined is about 1359 in your budget justification. So, uh, with that, do do want to ask a couple questions about economic analysis. Um, you know, the SEC, the FDIC, the FTC all have a, a chief economist. Do you have a, a similar position within the CFPB? So what we have is we have a research division uh, mm -hmm. that is composed of, of various people, including economists. Uh, 
we also have separately a markets division, which also engages in a lot of analysis, but maybe with something more of a, a direct practical eye to the operations of industry and how they how they work uh, and how different markets for products work. So those are two different sources of, of information, wisdom, and insight for the rest of the Bureau. But there is no comparable to a chief economist within the CFPB? or uh, I, don't, I don't know that we have something we designate as chief economist. We have economists at different levels, including those who supervise others. And maybe you could characterize uh, someone in that uh, hierarchy as the chief economist. I don't know that we've actually used that title. So who is the final say when, when you have uh, uh, a cost-benefit analysis. Well, we have a uh, we have an ex uh, you know experienced regulations team, uh, many of whom came from the Federal Reserve. Uh, we have uh, the research and the markets uh, people. We tend to work on a cross-team basis on cost-benefit analysis because it is time-consuming, somewhat elaborate, and we want to make sure that we get it right. Uh, in terms of uh, how all of that then gets processed uh, through the Bureau. Ultimately, that would go up to the Associate Director for the division, which we call RMR, which is Research Markets and Regulations. They sort of combine uh, together. Uh, ultimately, I would have sign off on all of that. Okay. So that, that is a wholly different process than what we've just gone through with the SEC, trying to make sure that you have a, uh, a, a group of economists that actually have uh, the opportunity to affix a cost and a benefit analysis before final rulemaking is, is issued, and so the public has some proper knowledge of that. Um, I certainly understand that you don't have much clarity on what that process is um, in, in terms of you know being two hours in on your testimony. Uh, you mean but, the SEC process? Well, or? no, no, no. Your process that is similar that will be the counterpart to what the SEC or the FDIC or the FTC does for a cost-benefit analysis. I see. So, so we developed our process after consulting with those other agencies because they obviously had years of experience with cost-benefit analysis. And a number not of all lawsuits. Of it, not all that have the lawsuits. experience. Right, yeah. exactly. So we tried to learn from them both what they did that they thought worked, what they did that they understood had not worked very well, uh, and we drew up our process accordingly. I don't know that our process mirrors exactly what's done at other agencies, and there's probably some uniqueness in each of the processes. But Would you provide for me, um, in written response, um, outlining this procedure and practice within the uh, CFPB? Sure. We'd be okay. glad to do that. I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, now, uh, in terms of behavioral economics, uh, what utilization uh, how does the uh, CFPB utilize behavioral economics? Well, we're trying to uh, build behavioral economics into what we do. We're trying to understand, not make judgments in the abstract in a somewhat academic way, but think about how consumers actually behave and uh, how, how our rules and, and other uh, activities uh, should take account of what kind of things consumers actually do. Uh, by the way, industry does this very well. They have been uh, attentive to the new behavioral economics. Uh, they think about that as they market products. They think about that as they design products. They think about that and the kind of products that they're looking to deliver. So it feels like we need to keep up with industry. And also, we need to be practical about how our rules actually apply. I mean, it's one thing to write a rule in the abstract, and you can write lots of pretty text and put it in the Federal Register. But if it isn't really coordinated with how consumers actually behave, then it's not very helpful. One of the ways this has shown up for us is we're doing a lot of consumer testing around, for example, the forms uh, in the in the combination of the Truth and Lending Act uh, RESPA forms. Uh, there have been a lot of testing with consumers to try to see what they're taking away, what they're understanding, what they're not understanding, what they're stumbling over, what they're, what they're getting. Uh, that did lead us, and there's been some disagreement about this, to take the APR, annual percentage rate number, uh, and put it on 
page 3 of our form rather than page 1 because we found that consumers typically were confused by that. It was, it was in, in practice, not as easy for them to understand that as, as maybe people thought theoretically would be the case. So uh, we're trying to respond to what consumers actually do, uh, to what they actually know, to what they understand, and we're trying to use that to build our forms. So it, it, the concern I would have is the use of your use of behavioral economics uh, is to inform uh, regulators uh, as a regulator um, how consumers make decisions. There's also a tension within that uh, in that there is a, a, a substantial part of uh, behavioral economic theory that would tell you that you need to limit choices. Um, and uh, limit the choice set and, and the choice architecture of decisions consumers make. So that tension between a regulator understanding how uh, consumers make decisions um, versus limiting products um, is, is a great concern from my perspective here on the Hill, because it shouldn't be a regulator's uh, uh, policies and procedures that lead to limiting choices for consumers. It should be to inform how consumers make decisions uh, so the regulator understands that, not for the regulator to prescribe that limitation of options for consumers. Do you agree or do you disagree with, with what, I, what I've just said? I, I think what you just said uh, is a great insight and it's something that we wrestle with. Uh, certainly much of what we have been doing has been uh, targeted addressing clearer, simpler, straightforward disclosures so that consumers can know what choices they're making. Are there times where certain acts, and, and I don't tend to focus on products per se, I mean I tend to share I think some of your skepticism about us banning products. Uh, what the statute speaks to is us addressing acts or practices. So for example, the um, enforcement action that just was uh, uh, completed had to do with deceptive marketing uh, of, of products, you know, which again I think interferes with consumers making fair and, and sensible choices for themselves if they're deceived or misled. Uh, but uh, we, we have really not, I think, been thinking in terms of banning products per se. So to the extent that you think that may be some portion of the behavioral economics school of thought, and I would confess that I'm not an expert in it. I've been uh, learning about it, uh, learning many things since I uh, took this position. Uh, I, I don't know that that's uh, a focus of our attention so much as trying to understand consumer behavior, understand some of the things that are you know, not necessarily obvious or rational in consumer behavior. For example, once you have something, there's a greater concern about losing it than there was about obtaining it in the first place. Just, uh, there's some time frame constraints where consumers may tend to uh, down, downplay things that occur more in the long term than things that occur right away. Uh, various ways that consumers actually think and behave that may not be obvious to uh, people who think that we're all perfectly rational. So, uh, but I, but I'm, I don't tend to think, uh, and I don't think we're approaching this from a standpoint of of uh, limiting choices. Uh, uh, but I'm, but I'm not sure I fully understand the entire uh, school of behavioral economics. In fact, I know that I don't at this point. <laughs> well, I, I certainly appreciate your humility in in, in that answer, um, implicit in that answer, um, and and I. I, I just wanted to understand your frame of reference for, for this process, mm -hmm. obviously. <clears throat> so uh, if I can close by just asking a couple, and if you could just keep it brief uh, uh, as the time is short. Um, again, this, this question of abusive practices. Do you have an intention to lay this out in rulemaking? Uh, in, in, in a formalized way, clear examples and clarifications on what that definition is and how the Bureau sees it. So again, I'm not close-minded on that subject. I think at the moment we have no present intention to launch a rulemaking uh, on that issue. Uh, we're pretty tied up through the remainder of this year uh, with the mortgage rulemakings. We'll be hard-pressed to meet those deadlines, although I believe that we will. Uh, uh, we have uh, 
been examining institutions uh, around the UDAP uh, procedures. I, I don't know that we to date have identified specific abusive practices, although much of that's in, in process. So uh, I, I don't think we have an intention to launch a, an abusive rulemaking at this time. Okay. Um, so the answer is no. I, I think that's that's correct as of, okay. as of this, uh, this moment. Would, would you commit to a formali formalizing pro the process um, for evaluating the acts? Uh, the, well, let me restate this. Let me restate this. Commit, would you commit to formalizing the process for evaluating credit access in rulemaking and examinations? I think that we. It is part of our process now. Uh, but would you commit to formalizing that process? I'm not sure what you mean by formalizing. As in outlining it so there are expectations from the private sector. I see. So, so in our examination process, we have an examination manual. Again, it, it borders on the long side, but it's on our website. Much of it is adapted from procedures that other uh, banking agencies have used. And we've also given more specific guidance about particular uh, products that we're examining around. Those modules are also on our website. They're, they're publicly uh, transparent for institutions and others. Uh, to assess, so I, I, that's a way in which we've formalized that process. Our rulemaking process is very stylized in, in terms of the law. We have the Sabrifa panels, we have the proposal stage, we have a notice and comment procedure. I understand, and, yeah, and, and right. not to cut you off, but uh -huh. I, to get to the point of this hearing, it's access to credit. Yes. The availability at, of credit and the access to it. The availability of credit is one thing. The financial crisis proved out, as you outlined, that when institutions lose their rears, um, so to speak, if I, if I may be uh, overly technical. Appreciate you cleaning uh, that up. Yep. Um, <clears throat> when institutions fail or have to be bailed out yep. by the government for bad decisions they made in loaning people money or investing, that constricts credit for everyday consumers. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. Also. As a part of that, that, that is the availability of credit becomes constrained. Access to credit can be constrained as a result of less availability of credit, yes. Mm -hmm. So that can be a decision made by businesses or banks. It can also be as a result of government regulation. That is our discussion. That is our intention today is to get to the heart of that. Mm -hmm. So what I would like you to address, and if I may say it that way, I, I would encourage you to look at access to credit and to mention this in terms of your rulemaking, the impact that your rules will have on access to credit as you see it. Because as I see it, there is this uh, a opportunity to overregulate and thereby constrain access to credit. I, I see. Maybe I see not ex and maybe not explicitly banning products, but having the results of products not being offered. That is my concern I would like to express to you. And I would certainly appreciate it if you would take that into account. I think the American people would appreciate that as well. I, 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 th I understand your, your point now, and I didn't get it before. Uh, we do, in fact, that is one of the things we consider in the cost-benefit analysis is what the potential effect of a proposed rule would be on access to credit. Uh, that is one of the, there's only a handful of specific statutory mandates that we have, the objectives laid out by Congress in creating the Bureau. One of them is to give careful consideration to access to credit. And, I, and my understanding of, of how this makes sense is it's great to protect consumers with all elaborate protections you can think of, but if they can't get a loan, then you're really not helping consumers. So uh, they have to have access to credit, and then the credit needs to be presented on terms that are understandable, clear, and so forth. Uh, both of our, our objective, and I do think we're uniformly, as we uh, consider rules, uh, having a discussion of that and a consideration analysis of that. Uh, but I appreciate the comment, and, and we will make sure our process reflects that. Well, Mr. Cordray, <clears> thank <throat> you for submitting to congressional uh, oversight. Uh, I certainly appreciate the responsiveness uh, you have personally presented um, in uh, your time as director of the CFPB. As I mentioned, uh, and I've expressed to you personally, uh, the, the means of your appointment uh, I found uh, suspect, uh, uh, but uh, your actions 
uh, serving in this position uh, have, have been honorable. Even if at times I disagree with the actions you have taken, uh, you've done so in, a, in an honorable fashion. Um, and, uh, and we can disagree about uh, policies, procedures, and, and uh, even, even sometimes results. But uh, I certainly appreciate your willingness to be open about that. That is, uh, that is a very welcome thing. Uh, and thank you for your willingness to be here today. Sentiments mutual, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, we'll now dismiss this panel. Uh, and we will recess uh, for about a, a moment or two uh, before we begin our second panel.